Hey everybody. Uh, the big QR code you were seeing before is the URL to the presentation if you want to download it. I know that people in the back will have a little trouble trying to see the code that is probably below the half of the screen. Uh, if you want to follow along with the PDF um, and then you don't have to come to me afterwards and ask, can I get your presentation? There it is. Um, so, um, hello, my name is Thiago Macieira. As you can see, I'm presenting this next week in Dusseldorf for the LinuxCon Europe. If you're coming to Dusseldorf, you can probably see one of the other sessions there. You don't have to come to see me. Um, so my name is Thiago Macieira. I've been around high technology, as you can see, since I was a year and a half, um, at least close to keyboards, apparently. Um, I've been doing open source for over 15 years. I got started in this by trying to do something interesting with my life, just trying to see what could I make that was interesting. And I decided to try to do open source because that was the easiest one. Uh, and I decided to contribute doing IPv6 support for KDE back in 2000. That led me to get hired by Trolltech in uh, 2006. And ever since then, I've been doing Qt development in one way or another. Right now, I'm working for Intel. I live in Portland in uh, Oregon, the United States. So I arrived, came exclusively for Qt developer days and LinuxCon Europe, a large trip here uh, in Germany. I'm your also friendly Qt core developer. So most of the things I'm talking about here in this session today are things that we've developed in Qt Core in the last year, more or less. Uh, I've got, I had a lot of friend from, uh, a lot of help from friends from before. Uh, I can't claim originality with the idea though. That's something that got started even way back when in Qt 4.5. We've just been improving, getting help from different people. And uh, as we were doing it, um, we realized, hey, might be interesting to tell people about it. Uh, I presented this before in an internal Intel conference. And people were like, wow, I didn't know this existed. So um, that was quite interesting to, to figure out. So I'm expecting that everybody here knows assembly, right? <laughs> yeah. No, this is not an assembly lesson. So. I came here specifically to tell you that you do not have to write assembly. Um, many of the, the, the kernel developers, uh, many of the Intel developers I talked to in the internal conference I had were kernel developers. And uh, they're used to writing assembly code. And you know, we're Intel people, so we don't care, we just write x86 assembly code. It doesn't have to compile in other processors for us. And when they looked at it and said, well, this is very interesting. Um, so what I'm about to tell you is that there's a way to improve your application, make it even more powerful without having to write assembly. It's the next best thing to assembly because you're still writing C and C++ code, but you're not actually do going down to it. So before I go there, um, I'm gonna present you with an interview question. A friend of mine was doing the interview for this um, startup in the Silicon Valley. And he was just asked this question. Uh, and it's one of those questions that yeah, the interviewer asks you to figure out if you can think on your feet, if you know a little bit of algorithms. The question is, imagine you have a two megabyte chunk of data and you just want to calculate how many bits are set in that entire thing. How would you do it? And uh, there's an advice here, memory usage is not a constraint, though, of course, within reason. If you have to use 64 gigabytes of RAM, there's a problem there. So I want to hear from you. Does anybody want to venture a suggestion on how to do this? Martin? Uh, using, a table. using a table, that's a good one. Any other suggestions? Yeah. Yeah, just using a table, not too large one. Any other suggestions? Okay. Yeah. 
Exactly. I'll get there. So I'm not going to repeat until I get there. So the thing is, usually when people answer this, they try to do something like what I showed. Just try to count on each byte how many bits are set. And that is possible. It's not difficult. There's a lot of code. Um, I can't tell you just by looking at it which one is faster. Right? This one, of course, the left side has a lot more code than the right side. On the other hand, the right side has a loop, and between each iteration of the loop, I actually am modifying my variable. So processors are not the beasts we learned when we were at school that execute one instruction, then the next instruction, then the next instruction. What they do is that they try to execute everything in parallel and just verify when the one after needs de depends on the previous one having been done. So this one actually could execute everything in parallel. This one, not so much. So I can't tell you just by looking at it which one is faster. Here's an interesting thing. I tried to benchmark this. And just to tell you how smart compilers are, I had a block of data here, just pasted some text to make it for, for uh, two megabytes. And then I tried to run it with a benchmarking compiler, and I couldn't get a result. Just taking too long. And then I inspected, took a look at it, and then I realized the compiler knew this was a constant block of data and just calculated everything for me. So there was no calculation at all. It just gave me the result, and that's why I couldn't finish, because it was too fast. So when I wrote the benchmark, I decided, okay, let's do it differently on uh, the, the benchmark constructor, fill this with random data, and then let's calculate. So at least I could get an average. Now, the answer that Martin gave me is this one. Let's take a table instead. Instead of per byte trying to calculate how many bits are there, I just make a table. I chose to make a table here of 64 kilobytes. Right? So I can read every two bytes of my incoming data. I look it up there. This table, of course, is going to be generated. I, don't ho I hope that any nobody here tries to write it by hand. You just write a script to do it. Uh, and each entry in the table is going to contain um, is going to contain a number from zero to sixteen. So, by the way, I just realized this should not have been a short; it should have been something smaller. Um, this w would this work? Yes. What did you tell me afterwards, Martin? No, you you said it shouldn't be too big. Is this too big? How big is the cache, the first line cache on a modern computer? Even if you don't know, give me a ball ballpark. Is it in the order of kilobytes or of megabytes? 16 kilobytes? Anybody else? It's around that. How big is this? So this table does not fit in the cache. So this table is too big. So if this table is too big, I should make it smaller. Probably something in the round, uh, just put 256 entries here. That is sweet spot. Uh, I would require to be doing twice as many operations, but everything would fit in the L1 cache, and L1 cache is usually one cycle access time. Fair enough. This is the answer that the interviewer is asking, looking for. If the interviewer asks you next time you go for an interview, and um, they ask you how much to calculate, this is the answer they're looking for. Very often, I had uh, another, this friend of mine was telling me of the exercise he, he made, and there was another one they had uh, was um, I don't remember how to describe the, the exercise. It took a bit bit a while, but it was also a uh, translation table would have helped. So tables are very useful. Now the interesting thing is if I had had that answer, and remember working for Intel, right? I would have given the answer that my friend here told me. What's your name? Stefan, Stefan. So, which is this? Use the pop count instruction. And then, of course, the interviewer would have gone, huh? The interviewer, in this case, it was not a technical person. They were just asking by rote. Here's a list of questions, uh, probably HR or something. Uh, and I would say, right, use the answer. That there's an instruction that does it for you. Um, okay. 
I was discussing with uh, 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 a couple of other friends during lunch today about instructions that do everything for you. The Intel uh, processor has an instruction that does STRCMP for you. It's a beast of an instruction, but it's there. There's an instruction that does a, a population count. There's an instruction that does bit search, bit test. So, of course, if you have access to this instruction, let's use it. And here comes my presentation. When can I use it? So the question is, how do you use it? And when can I use it? Well, first, first solution that most people would have thought of is just use write assembly. But remember, I told you, you don't have to write assembly. My point here in this, this session is to tell you that you don't have to. There's such a thing called intrinsic. Let me define what an intrinsic is. An intrinsic is something that looks like a function, behaves like a function, because you can call it, but it doesn't exist as a function. You're never going to find the source code for this function in a library. If you want to find the source code for the instruction, you actually have to go into the compiler source code and see what it replaces this with. The, here, I have, we've got two flavors of instructions. There's the one I call the GCC intrinsic. So anything that you see in GCC starts with underscore, underscore, built-in. It's an intrinsic. It's a built-in intrinsic. So they have, for example, uh, built-in strlen, which does everything that strlen does, except that it doesn't make a call. It just inserts the code there for you. It's like an inline function. In this particular case, it inlines to a specific assembly instruction. Same thing with the Intel intrinsic. The Intel intrinsic is a standardized version of it because it's supported on GCC, Clang, the Intel compiler, Microsoft Visual Studio, and maybe even other compilers that work on um, x86 architecture. The MM is because it came from multimedia. These intrinsics started with MMX. And the U32 means that the payload is an unsigned 32-bit information. OK, so go off and do it. Now the question, second question, after being told what to use is, when can I use it? Well, if you know that your processor always supports this particular instruction, Use it unconditionally. There's a lot of those that you're going to find if you're trying to do this kind of optimizations because all these 64-bit processors that probably everybody here has, all the 64-bit processors have, at minimum, SSE2. So any instruction that you look up in the documentation and find out that it's SSE2, just use unconditionally. There's no need to verify which, which system has it. If you're writing, for example, an embedded device, if you're writing for an embedded device, you know exactly which processor you have, then use it unconditionally as well. Or unconditionally don't use it, because if you know that it's never going to support it, there's no need to do at runtime. If you have to do it at runtime, you can simply check the ID of the CPU. There's a lot of flags saying what it supports or not. And then there are two more solutions here. You can ask the linker for help. I'll show you later how to do it. And you can check if the surrounding code is already using it. Um, again, I'll show you at the end how to do it, or co closer than the end. So let's choose which solution we want. Like I was saying, you have to know which CPUs your code is going to run in. You have to know which compilers and toolchains you're going to work with. Not all of them will support all of the intrinsics. Not all of them generate nice code. So depends a lot on that, the quality. And depends also on the libraries you're using, because if you're using Qt, well, all of this is already mostly done. You have to check as well whether it's benefit or not. So many of the things that I'm going to show you are unconditional, even though there's a clear benefit in using them. Why would I do unconditional use or non-use 
if there's a clear benefit in using. The reason is that the CPU ID check is expensive. Sometimes more expensive than the benefit. So you have to benchmark. If I'm telling you here all of this is useful, I'm not still telling you that you don't need to benchmark. You might write the code and see, it looks nice. I've managed to do sync 16 times more throughput. But is it worth it? Just make sure that the cost of doing things isn't worse. Always benchmark. And by the way, testlib helps you with benchmarking. You can write benchmarks with testlib. And if you're running on x86, you can even ask it to tell you cycle, how many cycles it took, how many instructions, how many cache misses. There's a lot of information on testlib that allows you to just run this and give you the benchmark information. <laughs> okay. Um, quick disclaimer. From now on, I'm going to restrict myself to x86. I work for Intel. I don't care about other architectures. They exist, right? Um, specifically, uh, Intrinsics exist for ARM and PowerPC. Um, I know that MIPS has the DSP, but I've never seen it has, have Intrinsics. So everything I'm talking about here could apply for ARM Neon and apparently for PowerPC Altivec. Uh, I've never programmed with Altivec. I don't have any experience with it. I do have experience when I was still working at Nokia with Neon uh, in ARM. And I can tell you that the quality varies a lot. The quality of the implementation varies a lot. When we were trying to do the N9, we were using GCC 4.4, if I'm not mistaken. And it was just pointless to try and use the intrinsics because the compiler would always save it to memory and load it back to memory, every single register you use. So it just wasn't worth using intrinsics. We had to write assembly by hand. And some of the features that I'm going to talk about that are compiler and linker features are not implemented for all these architectures yet. So if you're choosing an embedded system, please choose Intel. OK, so how do I know which intrinsics to use? I don't know which assembly instructions to use. What do I consult? Never the Intel website. Really? You can only read it with, with Google Chrome. So don't, don't use the website. Download the PDF. Download the PDF. So when you're out in a sunny day, apparently it's not a warm day, uh, just take your copy with you. Don't print it, please. Save the rainforest. That's a 3,400 doc page document. Um, keep it in your PDF, uh, in your tablet reader, your laptop. You probably have a laptop if you're programming, right? Um, this is the Intel 64 and IA32 architecture software development manual. If you look for Intel SDM online, you're going to find it. Uh, this includes information on almost everything about the architecture. We're interested in volume two that contains in instructions. Everything else is only if you're curious or if you're writing an operating system and things like that. So. Um, This will teach you both. Will teach you both the assembly and the intrinsic. Let, let's let's think of it for a while before we go further on on the intrinsics. Why should I use intrinsic in the first place? Why can't I use assembly? Well, you can, you can. So what's the advantage in using intrinsics, or the advantage in using assembly by hand? So yes, you don't have to care about the register location. You leave this boring task to the compiler. True. Other reasons? Why not write assembly? That's a very good point. I'm going to rephrase it slightly different. Uh, different architectures run instructions differently. But 
So the timing of instructions, the ordering of instructions, is a task best left to the compiler. Right? It knows the architectures. Why should you care about it? I just know, run these in the, in the order that is best for you. Assembly will run in exactly the order that you wrote. Right? So yes, that's a very good point. Another one I have here is that, of course, Microsoft does everything different. And the syntax of the assembly for Microsoft tool chains is different. So you would have to keep two sets of them. And that's our problem in Qt. We don't want to have to maintain .asm and .s files, because we just want one of them. Um, a disadvantage of using intrinsics is that sometimes the compiler does not get what you want and generates more code than a finely tuned assembly would have, re would have done. So there's a bit of a disadvantage. So suppose that you downloaded this document. Uh, you can Google for it, download it, um, and you start looking for it. You're going to find a page like this. So um, you open it. You search for the pop count instruction. It's going to tell you the instruction does this. There's a large section I didn't include here that is explains what it does, in which conditions it will work, etc. And at the very bottom, it lists the uh, intrinsic. So it's showing me here two of them, even though there are actually three, right? It's showing me three types, 16, 32, and 64-bit. Um, and then it showed me two intrinsics. Um, so now I know which, which intrinsic, which look, it looks like a function to use. I just have to use it in my code. And let me give you the example of how to do it. Here's the bit count. Um, using not the Intel intrinsic, but using the GCC, it's identical, using that to calculate the two megabyte population count as before. Um, sorry for the people in the back. If you're not seeing, you can, download, again, look at the presentation online. What it does is that it simply is accumulating, so adding to the result the pop count of each 32-bit section. So actually, I'm running half the number of iterations as I had in my um, first example, which had a table too large. It would be one-fourth the number of iterations if I had the right size table. And better than that, this is actually a basically one cycle instruction. There's never any memory access. Sorry, there is one memory access, which is this, right? There's one here. There isn't a second one. The CPU will pipeline, yes. So this is interesting, uh, and I have the example here of CRC32, right? So calculate the CRC32 of a block of data. Um, unlike the previous one, it, this one takes two arguments. So the interesting thing is that this looks like a regular function, but it expands to one assembly instruction. This works for almost all of the x86 instructions. So even, for example, rotate which is an instruction that's been there since time immemorial, there's an intrinsic for it. Most of all the new instructions exist. Of course, you're not going to find an instruction for add, because you can just add. But th the other thing is that, th and this was coming to the, what the gentleman said in the back, this benefits from the compiler optimizations. So the compiler can decide that it will unroll this loop. This loop. I wrote only one, right? I only wrote one pop population count. The compiler can think, hmm, I will just call four times and increment once. And the compiler also can detect which instruction to use. Uh, one example I didn't show here is um, bit search. So searching for the first or the last bit set, also known as counting the number of zeros. The architecture has two instructions of those. So we'll try two for each. The newest one is, of course, more optimized. That's why we added it. If the compiler knows that you're using that, comp that particular processor, it will use the new instruction. If otherwise, it will use the old instruction. So all of this benefits because Everything I kept here, this works with Visual Studio. This is easy to maintain. And as the compilers mature themselves, this will automatically get improved. I don't have to worry about it. Convinced so far? 
kind of. I could have done 64-bit. You know why I didn't? Let me go back here, because this is telling me that the 64-bit does not run on 32-bit processors. Right? So you have to look at the manual to see how it works. But yes, I could have done 64. If I knew that I'm doing 64-bit, I could do this. And I think that the I actually did use 64-bit when I wrote qubit array population count. So qubit array is using this. Uh, qubit array uses this. Qhash uses this. So where are they allowed? Oh, good question. Where can I put the code? If you're using Visual Studio or the Intel compiler, you can just put them anywhere. What do I mean by anywhere? Of course, it has to be inside the body of a function, but nothing special. Unlike those, Clang and GCC up until 4.8, you could only include the header that defines them and write them in a function if the compiler is targeting that particular architecture. With GCC 4.9 or later, you can just tell it um, this particular function is doing um, AVX, for example. So generate code for it, and I'm allowed to use the intrinsics. Um, There's a pretty clear benefit. I like the way GCC is doing it better because um, it will not inline this function. It knows because think of compiler optimizations. I've got my CPU ID check followed by the use of the instruction. The compiler is seeing everything. It might decide, well, just move something above. And all of a sudden, I'm using an instruction before I checked whether the instruction, instruction is permitted. The way GCC does is that this block only do not inline it in another function. Unless the other function is also targeting something better, then it will inline. So I like the way GCC does. It allows me to clearly target and mark this function as something specific. So let me show you how we did it. Uh, this is how it's done in Qt 5.4. There's a macro for testing with if, which is Qt compiler supports here, and then the macro that expands to the uh, underscore underscore attribute. Hey, hold on. Didn't I just say that you can use it anywhere? Why do I have to have the, the hash if? Well, two reasons. First is that GCC 4.8 and Clang depends on the compiler options. And second, if you're using an older compiler, imagine we went all the way back to five, uh, GCC 5, 4.5, it might not support some of the instructions. So uh, the way this is done is that we check when you configure Qt, whether the compiler supports it. This has generated quite a few questions for us because people read the output of configure and say, AVX2, yes. And then they go like, my computer doesn't have it. How are you enabling this thing? No, we're not enabling. We're just saying your compiler supports it. We'll figure out how to do it later. And this is how. So this is the example, again, from Qhash. Uh, how do we do CRC32 calculation? This is actually... The function is not called Q, uh, I think it is called CRC32. And you can see that if it does support SSE 4.2, we're going to implement it using the 64 bit, right? Uh, the functions here correctly. If it doesn't support, we do Q unreachable. No, that's because we're never going to call it, right? Uh, if we don't support this instruction, we're going to use a simpler algorithm to do the hashing. The reason I used CRC32 is that I was benchmarking Qt Core. Actually, I was benchmarking Creator. And looked at it and said, which function is now consuming the most time inside Qt Core? I care about Qt Core. I'm the Qt Core maintainer. And it turns out it was the QHash function for QStrings. I thought, OK, let's try and optimize this function. What can I use? that will work nicely as a hashing function. So I was looking for algorithms online that were parallelizable. And then all of a sudden, I don't know if it was a suggestion by somebody or whether it was just something dawned on me, there's the CRC32 instruction. It's not a hashing function, 
but it's good enough because it just throws bits around when you supply it data. So it's a good hashing function. It's too expensive to do by hand. So we're never going to implement QHash using CRC32 uh, CRC unless the compiler supports it. So you can see here how we improved QHash with compiler support, with the processor support, in the case where it's supported. If it doesn't, then we keep where it is. The interesting thing here is this is only static. There is no runtime dispatching. As you can see, compile one or compile the other. There's no in between. So how would I do runtime dispatching? Any questions so far? Yes, Martin. How expensive is the CPU ID? It's a pretty expensive instruction. And the reason is that it's a serializing instruction. It stops the entire pipeline, runs it, and then restores it. So it, it's, it takes quite a few cycles, plus it has to flush the cache. You don't want to do that too often. So um, the next slide after this is going to discuss it. But yes, CPU ID is pretty expensive. So how would you do it? Yes, you have to detect the CPU. You have to do the CPU ID. Determine which implementation of among those you have is best. Usually it's fallback, right? And then you call it. So imagine I have only two implementations. I have the SSC2 version and the plain version that I wrote with regular uh, C++ code. And if some magic happens that I verify whether it supports SSC2, Call it, otherwise don't. So the question I have is, how do I implement that magic here? That would be calling CPU ID, but how? Well, if you have GCC 4.8, it has another underscore underscore built in, so another intrinsic that does it for you. Unfortunately, this does not work with any other compiler but GCC 4.8 and up, so we can't really use it. Another drawback is that they didn't implement this, they didn't optimize it too much. It always checks, even though you're compiling for a target that always has CC2. So how did I do this for Qt? Let's look at it. There's this function called QDetectCPUFeatures, and another function which is QCPUFeatures. And what it does is it verifies whether this global variable has been initialized, calls detect, and then continues on. So the CPU ID code goes there. It's centralized in one place. There, I actually did have to write assembly. There wasn't much of a choice. So there's code for Visual Studio, there's code for GCC, Clang, um, and then after that, I can do it on my own. Remember to cache the result. That's what we said. Uh, CPU ID is expensive. You don't want to call it every time. So you want to at least cache the result. That's why this function always checks the global variable first and verifies if it's initialized. If it's initialized, skip CPU ID again, just return the value. I'm not actually going to show you CPU ID. It's a boring function, and Qt has already done it. Unfortunately, all of this is in a private header. If you want to use it, talk to me. We can discuss how to possibly do it. I've been meaning to make this public. I haven't done yet. So if there's a lot of interest, we can make it public. Right now, this is on a private header. So I'm not going to show you CPU ID because, well, Qt has already done it. So let's just use it. Remember what I just said as well. The compiler, when I was showing this code here, GCC does not know whether I already enabled SSE. So the other thing I said is that check surrounding code. You do it by checking macros. Uh, let me show you here. So I just ran here. Let me just increase the code, uh, the size. I just ran GCC um, with no arguments, comparing the macro set with a March native. So I have a Haswell. And you can see it's showing um, every single define 
Um, have you used the com application before, command line tool? It's like diff, but side by side. So the first column is the one um, that is only on the first one. So you can see uh, regular 586 Pentium class. The second column is stuff that is only present in the second uh, output. And then you can see all the macros of every single CPU feature that got enabled, like SSC 4.2, like AVX and AVX2. Already. Um, so let's put it together. Wrong. Uh, I need to move back. Let's put it together. So I have this macro called CPU has feature that receives that, right? And this is basically comparing the macros that were set by the compiler with the CPU ID. So it does both at the same time. The end result is that if I'm compiling this on 64-bit, which always has a CC2, this is unconditional. So I made the runtime dispatching become unconditional. More yet, um, this is now dead code. Compiler will just remove it. OK, I said that we could ask the dynamic linker for help. Uh, magic goes here. This is, a fun uh, this is a functionality called indirect function. It only runs on Linux. It only exists on Linux. And not only that, it requires specific version or hires of glibc, binutils, which in turn means that you can't do this with Android. Bionic does not have support for it. The way it works is that you tell the compiler, whenever I call the memcopy function, I want you to resolve which function first. So I gave it the name. And the function I did is that I, I just verify whether the feature exists and return one of the two. So this function that I have in here in the bottom is called at load time. As soon as somebody tries to call this function, or as soon as the, the program loads, the dynamic linker is going to call my function, get, it res get the result, and save it in memory. So whenever I call memcopy, I'm indirectly, copy uh, I'm indirectly calling one of these other two functions. <coughs> I showed this to kernel developers. I'm like, oh, that's nice. Let me just blow your mind with C++ for 14. Right, so it's a little simpler code just to nag them. Hey, C++. I had Linus Torvalds in the room when I, when I showed this and like, eh, he doesn't like C++. But he's writing an application using C++ and Qt. Mind blown? Let's take one step further. So this one is also C++ only. It came with GCC 4.9. Um, instead of doing the manual function, manually deciding which function to call and writing the indirect function, well, why, don't the, why doesn't the compiler do it for me? Just tell it that I have bit count function that exists uh, the default with a table or the one with population count. So this one now, this, uh, remember the attribute saying this function here exists, uh, it requires the pop count functionality. And this one works without. I just declare both of them like this. As soon as when you make the call, the compiler will either directly call the one that is correct because it knows, or it will do the indirect function as before. So it will generate that function for me. This is C++ only. So again, I was nagging the kernel developers. You can't have this. OK, let's try again to look at interview questions. How would you write a function that returns a 32-bit random number? How would you zero extend a block of data to eight, from 8 to 16-bit? Or how would you calculate the next power of 2 for a given non-zero integer? Uh, of course, these are all trick questions. The correct answer is to use the Intel instruction that does it. Um, the middle one, can you tell me which algorithm would benefit from it. 
what kind of function in Qt would you see just zero extending a block of data from 8 bits to 16 bit? Yes, thank you. Converting Latin 1 to UTF-16. This is exactly what I was doing last year that prompted me to think about this presentation. I was optimizing the Q from Q string from Latin 1. Um, the example I have here is how do you calculate the next power of 2 for a given integer? This is how you would do it by hand. We have this in Qt in a function called alloc more, which doesn't allocate anything. It's misnomer should have been calculate the next size of your block of data if I'm extending it. So whenever you're appending to, for example, a Q-string, a Q-vector, things like that, or a byte array, and you reach the limit, it calculates, well, I'm going to reallocate. Why don't I reallocate a bit more so that whenever you hit again, you're appending, I don't have to reallocate all the time. So what it does is that it calculates the next power of 2 for your block, right? So if you've got um, a byte array or uh, a Q-vector of 64 bytes and you're appending the 65th, it will just then extend to 128. So this is the, the code that was written. And I remember when João wrote this and I was, okay, I need to sit down with pen and paper and verify that this algorithm is right. Trust me, it is. Of course, how would I do it? And uh, I was talk. how did we do this for Qt 5.4? Here's how. Bit scanning. Calculating the next power of 2 is basically finding the last, the, the highest bit set and get the next one, right? So I just need to get the last, the highest bit set and then get the next. That's why it's 2 here, not 1, right? I want the next one. So just to summarize, um, learn from the manual use the intrinsic. So you can learn from it and figure out what to do. Sometimes I, I look at the manual, see how, what could I optimize today? Uh, it's kind of like pinky and the brain, what are we going to do tonight? <laughs> are you pondering what I'm pondering, pinky and brain? How can we get Mel Gibson in a chicken suit? Um, check the CPU compile time, runtime, and dispatch. Use what your compiler does it for you. When I wrote library, I mean Qt. I didn't write it here because it goes without saying benchmark. Don't waste time optimizing stuff that doesn't give you much benefit. On the other hand, benchmark after you've done it to verify that you did get a benefit at all. I have more code. Before I go into the code, let's see if you have questions. Uh, I could stop the presentation here as well. Martin. Can you switch back to the other one because I have light in my face? Yeah, so the question here, let me just repeat, let me just repeat. So the CPU doesn't change that often, of course. So you couldn't I just do once on installation? I'm going to extend your question, why can't I just, just do it once when I load the application? Because definitely the CPU will not change while the application is running. Even if you do hot plugging, you should always have the same type of CPU. Anyway, um, yes, that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense to do the caching. So that's why I said cache the result. We do it a lot in um, the algorithms in QPainter. All of those are checked at runtime, but cached. So we only do it once. The thing is, for the string operations, even the cache, cache the check, is too expensive. Strings are short. I said yesterday in my presentation, 
85% of strings are less than 16 bytes in size. 50% of them are one or two characters only. So the fact is that the, even the attempt to verify cached result is more expensive than the benefit of using this. So this is why some of the things I showed are not at all runtime dispatched. They're only compile time dispatched. If you want to do it on installation, by the way, since Qt 5.3, if you're compiling for 32-bit x86, it automatically enables everything SSC2 because we decided those CPUs are over 10 years old now. We're just going to use it. If you have to use older versions of, C of the code, you have to compile it differently. So we, of course, Debian said, we can't do this. It's sooner in the room. There is sooner. So uh, our packager from uh, Debian said, we can't do this. We have to keep the old code because Debian still cares for Pentium and 486. So how do we do this? There's a trick with Linux that you can install both libraries in different directories and it will load the one that works. So there's a trick that we could do and that solved the problem. Other questions? Do you want to see more code? More code. Okay. So the zero extending. This is the core of the loop of Q string from Latin one. Simple, right? Here's another interesting thing. The compiler does optimize this. If I tell the compiler F3 vectorize, which is enabled at O3 levels, it does it on its own. So the compiler automatically tries to do a good job by expanding it. As you can see with three different compilers, GCC 4.8, Clang 3.4, and ICC 14, they generated very vastly different codes because they don't have the information how big this thing is. Um, I'm going to interpret the code for you. Here, GCC loads 16 bytes, unpacks, and then writes 32 bytes. Clang loads 8 bytes and writes and it loads twice 8 bytes and then writes uh, 32 bytes. ICC loads 8 bytes and writes 16. So they have very, very timing, the timing is very different of them. Especially here ICC, it works with strings that are up to 8 um, bytes long. The other ones would have, um, would only work from 16 bytes and up. Like I said, remember, 85% of the strings are less than 16 bytes. So the, the bottom one from ICC would actually benefit more. So what could we do? Um, oh, I just have another example. If, I, if you pass the AVX2, uh, it just be became worse. Because now I load 16, write 32, load 16, write 32, and I think I hear I'm loading 24, writing 48. So it just became very different. So what did I do? I actually looked at this and decided, this looks nice. Let me just write it with intrinsics. That's what I did. So if you look at the Qt source code today, this is what you're going to find. This is in uh, QString from Latin 1. Load, unpack, store, unpack, store. So this is what I did a simple way to optimize it. Now I have <coughs> I have the code very similar, but all of them are generating more or less the same thing. I have the same performance on all of the examples. Whether it's better or worse, we have to benchmark. I can't tell you just by looking which one is better. And now I'm really done.